Carinibacterium diphtherae is really primarily a human pathogen, although it has occasionally been reported in animals. At present, it's quite uncommon in developed countries, and so when we see infections in people here in Canada, it's oftentimes travel associated. In people, respiratory diphtheria is most common, and it's characterized by the formation of a very classical lesion. So this is the diphtheritic pseudomembrane, which forms over the pharynx. This pseudomembrane is comprised of organisms, fibrin, and inflammatory cells. Diphtheria only results from toxigenic strains. So non-toxigenic Carinibacterium diphtherae is unable to produce clinical disease in people. Because of this, disease can be effectively prevented using toxoid vaccines. And the DPT, or diphtheria toxoid, pertussis acellular antigen, and tetanus toxoid is really a classical example that's been very successful at controlling the impact of this potential pathogen. In these images here from the United States Centers for Disease Control, you can see this patient with a very swollen throat. Um, this child has pharyngeal diphtheria. And then on the right, you can see an example of cutaneous diphtheria. And in animals which have had infections with Carinibacterium diphtherae or toxigenic strains of other species, typically the lesions are cutaneous. I mentioned the DTP uh, vaccine already. Um, this has been very, very successful at reducing the annual incidence of diphtheria worldwide. You can see on this figure from the World Health Organization, um, we have year on the x-axis and number of cases, number of annual cases on the y-axis. And as global vaccination coverage increased from sort of the early 1980s, from about 25 or 30 percent up until our present levels of coverage, the incidence of diphtheria has decreased quite precipitously, just demonstrating the, eff the efficacy and utility of, of this uh, prophylactic measure. Moving on to rhodococcus equi. This is a cause of severe bronchopneumonia in young foals. It's a common cause of pneumonia in foals three weeks to five months old, and it's described as a chronic separative bronchopneumonia. In older horses, what we tend to see is actually abscessation as opposed to respiratory involvement. Enteric disease is also frequently coincident in foals with pneumonia, so about 50% of them will have lesions in their gastrointestinal tract. And we think that these enteric infections happen either through consuming the organism by the fecal oral route or through swallowing expectorated sputum. So they're coughing up infectious material from their bronchopneumonia and then swallowing it. In these cases, typically we see the pneumonia first and then enteric disease develops later. Grossly, enteric lesions are multifocal ulcerative enterocolitis and tiflitis, so inflammation of the colon and cecum. And clinically, we'll see weight loss, diarrhea, and colic. Rhodococcus equi uh, is generally acquired from the environment, so it's found in soils, and particularly in those soils which are contaminated with horse feces. Because it's found in soils contaminated with horse feces, and it's so ubiquitous, why don't we see disease more commonly? Um, we really don't have a good explanation for that. It could be that we have differences in the virulence of uh, strains found on different farms. Perhaps there's protective management practices. We really aren't sure. One thing we do know with respect to the uh, uh, pathogenicity of, of rhodococcus strains is that we only see disease in horses caused by VAP-A positive strains, so the virulence-associated protein A strains. Um, intermittently virulent isolates producing other VAP proteins have also been um, identified and seen as a cause of disease in people um, who have HIV and HIV-associated infections. Interestingly, these aren't found in horses, and so it seems like there may be some species-specific differences in disease pathogenesis. The prognosis in horses is fair um, among those with chronic disease, but poor in foals who have really acute disease. Treating rhodococcus equi bronchopneumonia really relies on antimicrobials, and generally this has been rifampin plus a macrolide type drug, whether it's azithromycin or clarithromycin. There's little evidence that specific management uh, uh, factors can, can play a role in preventing uh, further infection, 
but it seems reasonable to uh, speculate that cleaning up manure, avoiding overcrowding, reducing dust, and housing foals in well-ventilated areas may be beneficial. In this image, you can see the lungs from a horse affected with severe pyogranulomatous pneumonia, and you can see these large uh, separating lesions uh, throughout the lungs, and then this very uh, darkened, meaty-looking uh, lung parenchymal tissue. Here we have an image of an equine colon with ulcerative colitis caused by Rhodococcus equi, and I think you can appreciate that we have these deep ulcerative lesions uh, on the mucosal surface. On cytology, we can see organisms classical for Rhodococcus equi on uh, transtracheal wash collected uh, sputum samples. So these nice little uh, round bacteria here forming clumps. In our other veterinary species, Rhodococcus equi is rarely reported. Um, apparently it is increasing in cats, and this may have something to do with a larger population of immunocompromised animals, although we don't yet have a lot of data. Most commonly when cats are affected, we see cutaneous infections, so lesions which are characterized by pyogranulomatous inflammation. They're typically non-painful, and they're typically afebrile. Lesions are typically abscesses with draining tracts, plus or minus uh, lesions of parenchymal organs. Treatment of these infections evol involves uh, surgical drainage and debridement, plus antimicrobials. Specimens to collect um, for Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis, pus or exudates if we have ruptured uh, lymph nodes. For Carinibacterium renali group, we want to collect midstream urine. And then for Rhodococcus equi respiratory tract infections, transtracheal wash fluid. These samples need to be sent with transport media. They're somewhat delicate bacteria. And as is often the case, do not freeze samples. Crinibacterium will be picked up using standard culture methodology. It will certainly grow on blood agar, but cytology can also be very important for looking at uh, patient samples prior to a culture. Rhodococcus may grow better at lower temperatures, around 30 degrees Celsius, which is lower than the 35 to 37 we typically culture patient samples at in the lab. So make sure to inform the diagnostic lab if you suspect this bug so that they can handle it appropriately. Rhodococcus are partially acid fast, and so you may see acid fast organisms associated with macrophages on cytology if special staining is done. All of these organisms can be slow growers. They can take up to 48 hours to grow, and all of them will be readily identifiable biochemically, so no challenges there. Exposure to Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis can also be detected using serological techniques. So we can identify antibodies to the organism in the blood from patients that we're interested in testing. Because Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis is highly contagious, it may be advisable to collect blood from this goat here, as opposed to sticking a needle or trying to drain this abscessed lymph node here. By opening up this lesion, we potentially contaminate the environment with Carinibacterium pseudotuberculosis and expose other susceptible animals in the herd. At present, there are no recognized guidelines for interpreting antimicrobial susceptibility tests, so this data needs to be interpreted with caution, urge you to consult with your diagnostic lab. Cranibacterium pseudotuberculosis does have some zoonotic potential. Um, abscesses in people have been reported, and this is typically seen in those uh, individuals working directly with sheep, so sheep herders. Um, the highest risk periods are during shearing or well-performing necropsies, so situations where you may get a nick in the skin allowing the organism to enter. The Carinibacterium renali group is generally considered a low risk to human health. Oxygenic Carinibacterium ulcerans, so Carinibacterium ulcerans producing diphtheria toxin, um, causing cutaneous diphtheria in people, have also been identified from animals. So there's the potential for a risk here uh, in the case of skin infections. And then finally, Rhodococcus equi. This is not typically an organism that we consider to be contagious, so spreading from individual to individual. People who would be most susceptible would be immunocompromised patients, so those with lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, AIDS, or transplant patients on immunosuppressive therapy.
Cranibacterium pseudotuberculosis can be very difficult to treat. Um, these are intracellular infections, which makes antimicrobial therapy quite challenging. You need to get adequate drug concentrations to the site of infection. So whether it's within the cell or within those large caseating abscesses, achieving therapeutic drug concentrations is often an issue. Control measures used in cases of caseous lymphadenitis really depend on the prevalence of, of the disease in the region you're working in and what the goal is. So if you're trying to eliminate infections altogether and you take sort of a stamping out approach, um, that would be something that might be more beneficial in a low prevalence region. In high prevalence areas where many animals are going to be exposed or infected, you, you may be just trying to minimize disease impact. Crinibacterium are intrinsically resistant to phosphomycin. Um, this is generally not a, a drug that's used in veterinary medicine, but it may be relevant if you're treating a urinary tract uh, infection in a dog or a cat. For rhodococcus species, treatment generally relies on one of those MLSBK drugs, so a macrolide type drug, plus rifampin. And importantly, it's intrinsically resistant to penicillin, ampicillin, and the cephalosporins. Have a couple of new terms for today, and of course, some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.